Reconciliation. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It's always an honor to stand in this place and speak on behalf of the good people of Oak Bay Gordon Head. And uh, I, I'm very, I want to start by saying how fortunate I am to live and work in the territory of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, the Songhees and Esquimalt nations, from whom I've learned so much over the years. And I acknowledge that debt of gratitude to them today. As the Lieutenant Governor said on Monday when she delivered the speech from the throne, for the last four years this government has worked to go beyond those important land acknowledgements, but to really uh, forge new partnerships with Indigenous peoples of our province. And working together, I believe we are advancing the meaningful reconciliation and the work of decolonization that we are here to do. We'll say more about that in a moment. Also, as I rise, uh, I want to say thank you to Butch Dick for his powerful opening on the second session of the 42nd Parliament of the Province of British Columbia. Now, Mr. Speaker, I, I have three goals today, if I may, in responding to the speech from the throne. The first, it's the tradition uh, in speeches from uh, this throne to start, as the Lieutenant Governor did yesterday, uh, by celebrating and commemorating important residents of our province who've passed away over the, la over the past year. And I want to start, if I may, with a tribute to a friend and neighbour and great British Columbian who passed away over the last year. Secondly, I want to speak directly in response to the speech from the throne by amplifying some of the key messages and foreshadowing other matters that will come forward in the days to come. And thirdly, Mr. Speaker, I want to speak about the work underway in my ministry as I have the honour of serving as the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation and the privilege of spearheading an all-of-government response to the challenge of our times, namely reconciliation. Her Honour began her speech from the throne on Monday by acknowledging the passing of His Royal Highness, the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh at the age of 99. This was a remarkable person, much loved in my community, for his devoted service, not just in support of Her Majesty the Queen, but to the broader community. Fundamentally, Prince Philip was a public servant in the best sense of that word. I'm here to salute another public servant, one of the many who live and work in in my community of Oak Bay Gordon Head and who quietly go about their work literally to serve the public. Paul Jeffrey Jarman was one of those devoted public servants. Now, Mr. Speaker, during the pandemic, we've come to remember, perhaps more than in ordinary circumstances, the vital work of our public servants. So allow me to tell you a little bit about one of them. Paul Jarman passed away last year on October the 26th, on the day of his choosing. Paul died peacefully with the love of his life, Ruth Wittenberg, by his side. Ruth was his partner and spouse of 40 years and is with us today in the gallery. Paul was a neighbour and was also a great friend. After moving to Victoria from his home in Edmonton, he articled and then joined the legal services branch of the Ministry of Attorney General. Paul practiced primarily environmental and resource law for 35 years until he retired in 2011. Almost immediately after that retirement, sadly, Paul was diagnosed with myelodysplastic syndrome, or MDS, which is bone marrow cancer. But that didn't stop him from enjoying life to the full. And Ruth and Paul managed to travel around Russia, South America, Asia, and Europe. And Paul was an early ad adapter to the world of e-bikes, which I followed suit shortly afterward. He had adapted and adjusted without complaint to his new circumstance and remained focused on quality of life. Then he was diagnosed in September with pancreatic cancer. But his spirit never wavered. He made decisions about end of life with courage and determination. At law school, Paul was part of a community-based legal services group, 
helping disadvantaged or underfinanced individuals attending at city cells and advising on rights of detention, provincial court trials, etc. He had a great sense of fun, Mr. Speaker, a wicked and dry sense of humor that never descended, however, into cynicism. Richard Fife, the Deputy Attorney General for the province, recalls Paul's involvement in high profile matters, including uh, the Chilcotin Justice Inquiry and the Camano Completion Project, with his encyclopedic knowledge of environmental law, on which he drew regularly to ensure government was able to fill its obligations and still move forward with projects in the public interest. The Honourable Judge Bryan, a former Deputy Attorney General, spoke of Paul in these terms, and I quote, he was patient, calm, and professional at all times. Skills that served him well as a senior lawyer, dealing with the uniqueness of BC politics and the ever-changing client group in the bureaucracy. Paul was always the calm at the center of the storm with a broad smile and eternal wisdom born of many years of keeping clients and governments on the straight and narrow. Now I can attest, Mr. Speaker, to that sense of fun. In the 1980s, Paul tells the story of having been dispatched uh, by the provincial government to Salt Spring Island to advise the then chair of the Environmental Appeal Board that his services were no longer required. Apparently to confirm that a certain herbicide was environmentally benign, the former chair had famously drunk the herbicide in public and proclaimed that it had no effect whatsoever on his health. Paul calmly explained to the chair that there might have been a conflict of interest there and there may be problems with optics. And for his efforts, Paul was appointed the interim chair of the Environmental Appeal Board, during which time he wrote a very useful report with reform proposals that were subsequently implemented. Colleagues from the AG's ministry and from government generally re recall Paul's dry wit and his uh, demeanor during what he used to call the flap du jour. His deep knowledge to recall facts and details and consequences of past decisions and his role as a mentor. Let me conclude by referring to a young lawyer who uh, worked with Paul in his division in the ministry. And she said this, Paul was a true and stalwart mentor to me over the years at the branch and then afterwards during his retirement. He was always possessing of a sincere kindness. My parents were immigrants and didn't speak English very well. They were introduced once. And from then on, whenever Paul would see them passing on the street, he'd go out of his way to stop, greet them each by name, shake hands and chat for a few minutes. To immigrants of a certain generation, this courtesy was enormous. Now, Mr. Speaker, throughout this pandemic, we've been constantly reminded about our public servants. Paul was simply one of the best. He did his work with grace, humor, but always in the best interests of the crown and honoring the crown, the, the duty uh, to honor the crown. He cared deeply about justice and indigenous peoples and lived his professional life with their interests in mind. Paul Jarman will be deeply missed and always remembered. Now I want to turn, secondly, to the speech from the throne itself, which of course represents a roadmap, like any speech from the throne would be, uh, of what the government intends in the years to come, and especially during the next session of this parliament. But this can be a roadmap, Mr. Speaker, like no other. There couldn't be an ordinary speech from the throne because of the COVID-19 emergency that's turned all of our lives upside down. But we never must forget that there were two pandemics going on. There was the COVID pandemic and the shadow pandemic, of which we've heard so much today, the opioid overdose crisis that has devastated so many families across our province. It's telling that we lost 1,400 British Columbians to COVID-19, but lost over 1,800 to the overdose crisis since the pandemic began. And as we've heard today, this marks the fifth anniversary of the declaration uh, of a public health emergency in that regard. And so many people have been affected by this, so many families. We all know someone who's been affected by this directly or indirectly. And of course, I, 
would be remiss if I didn't note that there has been a disproportionate number of those British Columbians who were indigenous who suffered in this way. Or workers in, whose, whose back injury led to an addiction. Or people the ne next door who suffered as a consequence of, of depression or otherwise and found themselves in these, in these circumstances. And it, I, I salute my friend uh, Judy Darcy as the first minister of mental health and addiction and commend my current colleague, the member of the NIMO, for grappling with this scourge head on. The COVID pandemic has touched us all. Uh, we're so fed up, I know I am, not being able to see our families in different parts of the province or the country, having to work remotely, uh, not working at all in some cases. The terrible impact on my community of Oak Bay Gordon Head has been felt, of course, in the hospitality sector, the tourism sector generally, and in so many other sectors. Many of my constituents are seniors, Mr. Speaker, and they talk to me about their sense of loneliness, their frustration and despair. Others, young families, talk about the financial stresses that the has, uh, that pandemic has brought upon them, and young people of whom the member for Fraser Nicholas spoke not long ago and the special challenges facing them. I think we see, the, we see in the, uh, the generation that uh, is coming along the effects of this pandemic and higher rates of depression and anxiety that we are now at last talking about openly. I believe that there's light at the end of the tunnel, but no one would have predicted that it would have been so long a tunnel. We all have our heroes during the pandemic. My hero is my sister Joyce Rankin, who is the clinical manager of Street Health in downtown Toronto, where she provides long-term and intensive care management support for people in the downtown east end of Toronto who were struggling with mental health issues and are either homeless or precariously housed. And she runs the Out of the, court, out, out of the Cold program uh, in central Toronto and has done for many years. Add COVID to the mix and I simply don't know, don't know how Joyce copes or how so many others in our, that are our healthcare workers on the front line are coping during this difficult time. I believe, Mr. Speaker, that those people have built the foundation upon which our community currently rests. And I don't forget about grocery store workers or truck drivers. I don't forget about the farmers who kept food on the table for us and brought them, the truck drivers who brought it to us, and the grocery store workers who made it possible for us to stay well during these difficult times. And I will never forget the, the school teachers, the child care workers, those working in long-term care facilities, all of whom have faced unprecedented challenges and the beleaguered first responders of whom the Premier spoke earlier today, our firefighters, our paramedics, our police services. These are the people we depend on every day for our well-being. The Ministry of Health and our talented public health team have calmly tried to address the new variants of COVID-19, and Dr. Penny Ballam and her team are running the largest mass immunization program in our history. Mr. Speaker, British Columbians get that there's no playbook for a pandemic. Some armchair quarterbacks will challenge the decision that this team is, uh, makes from time to time. And that, of course, Mr. Speaker, is their absolute right in a democracy. Constructive criticism and adaptation will only serve to improve how we tackle this crisis. Now, one opposition party uh, said in a release after the throne speech, and I quote, our leadership is simply not measuring up in addressing the pandemic, close quote. Another opposition party said that, quote, this throne speech offered little help or hope. Mr. Speakers, others will decide whether that critique is helpful in this crisis. But I believe, and the vast majority of people in my community tell me that they also are grateful and trust the talented public servants who are helping us extract ourselves from this unprecedented crisis. I'm so happy that more than a million people have now been vaccinated in our province, at least with first dose, and I only wish we had a more dependable supply of vaccine from our federal partners. But we will get through this together, I'm confident we will, and optimistic that we will. 
Vaccination, of course, is centrally important to our economic recovery. Before the, pan the pandemic, I was so pleased that this government balanced every budget since its election in 2017. That's what Tommy Douglas did in the prairies for so many years. Before the pandemic, BC was a fiscal and economic leader in our country. We were one of the Canada's fastest growing economies with low unemployment and steadily rising wages. And we still, Mr. Speaker, have all the ingredients we need to usher in a very robust recovery. We've got a diversified economy. We have a very educated workforce. We've got a spirit of innovation and entrepreneurship. We've got clean technology. We've got natural resources. We are so blessed in British Columbia. Thanks to Clean BC and our government's commitment to justice and human rights for Indigenous people, I believe that we can seize the trillions of dollars of investment opportunity out there represented by what The Economist magazine has called the ESG revolution. Environment, social and governance. People are increasingly looking to where they can put their capital which aligns with their values. These ESG standards are being used around the world with increasing force and effect. ESG typically includes relationship with Indigenous peoples. The environment word, of course, speaks to all of the things that a particular company is doing or a jurisdiction is doing to ad address the crisis of climate change, for example. And British Columbia has a strong competitive advantage in this new world of post-ESG revolution. As ESG becomes a leading guidepost for investment, jurisdictions with strong ESG track records are well positioned to attract international business and investment. And we should all be doing a lot more, Mr. Speaker, to champion that advantage that we have. In this province, we're the only jurisdiction outside of Bolivia that has adopted and made the law of the land with universal support in this place, the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, a fundamental human rights act for, our, for the Indigenous peoples of our province. Clean BC gives us another competitive advantage. We're the only jurisdiction to set sectoral targets. These are things that investors around the world have noticed and will continue to notice. So, Mr. Speaker, perhaps it's a bit cheeky of me to say this, but I think I would call all of this the BC advantage. Last week, I told the BC Business Council just that, and I believe that there is an emerging consensus on this point, and I do not think, Mr. Speaker, we do enough to promote that. As the Lieutenant Governor said, our province has seen months of sustained job growth and currently has the highest job recovery rate in our country. Under new safety guidelines, our BC film and TV production has bounced back stronger than ever. Now, Mr. Speaker, I was so pleased last week to announce uh, that the province is uh, following up on a commitment made during the election, is investing $150,000 at Camosun College to assist it in providing a lease on its interurban campus and help with doing an expression of interest for a film production company to come and create what everyone in our community says is the necessary catalyst to make this Hollywood North Vancouver Island style. And that is, Mr. Speaker, a film studio, a sound studio. So indoor production can occur on feature films and television productions and the like. What an opportunity for students at Camosun College to be able to learn from the very best people actually in the business. And what an opportunity for all the people who are working in this sector, this clean economy, to come and work to, to pr the carpenters that are needed for set design, even students who want to learn how to do screenplay in the, from the English department will have opportunities if we can pull this off. Now the province has only put the ingredients there, now it's up to the private sector to respond, but I can tell you that uh, Sherry Bell, the uh, president of Camosun College, 
uh, who is uh, retiring at the end of this year and to whom I pay uh, tribute, uh, has been solidly behind this. The mayor of Saanich has likewise uh, been extremely supportive of this. This, Mr. Speaker, could be a game changer for the South Island. That's just one example of how we're trying to diversify our economy further and deal with people who have been left behind during the pandemic. Um, the, the tourism sector and the hospitality sector have been very hard hit. We all know that, and we're going to put in place the, the, the supports to help them get back on track. We need to ensure that our charitable organizations and the not-for-profit sector are also supported so they can help the people and the communities uh, where they work and play. I want to say a little bit more, Mr. Speaker, about the nonprofit sector. I did some research and I, I, I'm surprised to, to say that, uh, I think this figure will surprise many, that British Columbia has more than 29,000 nonprofit organizations in the health sector, environment, agriculture, education, social services, recreation, cooperatives, and the like. It provides a range of essential services to our communities, and the sector contributes $6.4 billion to BC's GDP and 86,000 jobs, three quarters of whom are women. Uh, the volunteer hours are at six billion estimate. So, Mr. Speaker, more needs to be done to ensure that that is seen as a sector. We talk about our nonprofit, we talk about our small business sector, etc. But this is a sector that deserves to be understood as such. And I'm very proud that our government is the first in Canada to have established a parliamentary secretary for community development and nonprofits. My friend, the MLA for Vancouver Hastings, has been given this very important responsibility. Mr. Speaker, I want to say, as my colleague, for the, uh, MLA for Fraser Nicola, just spoke so powerfully about a few moments ago, a little bit about the impact of the pandemic on our youth, just as they start their careers. You know, during the pandemic, youth unemployment reached 29%, over 15 percentage points above the provincial average. Now, in my community, I have Camosun College, the University of Victoria, and the Canadian College of Performing Arts. So this is super, what the province has just announced is so important to them. They announced that 15, the province announced that more than 5,000 youth and young adults across the province will have access to skills training and well-paid jobs through the almost $45 million Stronger BC Future Leaders program. Training for in-demand jobs to get to fulfilling careers, opportunities for stable, good jobs that can change the direction of a young, pers young person in these difficult times. Training, internship, job, job co-ops, jobs in the growing tech sector, environment, natural resource positions. These are some of the things that will be tailored uh, through this, this, uh, uh, this program. I see that the Ministry of Environment and Climate Strategy is creating a, up to 180 opportunities for young people to help uh, tackle the problem of marine pollution, plastic pollution in our coastal communities, and uh, an investment of $5 million in clean, close, uh, clean Coast, Clean Waters program aimed at youth employment. More will be said about that in the next few days. Positions in parks, positions in conservation officer service, and the like. And to to, con to, to confirm the government's commitment to youth in BC, the MLA for Nelson Creston has been appointed the Premier's Special Advisor on Youth, and she will serve as the point person for young people across government, providing a platform for them to engage directly with the province. Mr. Speaker, there is so much to say on the, on the economics aspect of, the, of this crisis that I, I don't quite know where to start. A lot will be said, of course, in the budget that will be coming up very soon, and improvements in health care, uh, uh, opportunities for business to grow and hire, record investments will be announced in infrastructure and the like to get BC back on track and to use that perhaps hackneyed expression, which I still like, build back better. You know, 
there's going to be a number of things that are already making life more affordable for British Columbia. I'm thinking of the uh, government's cutting of ICBC rates by 20%, expanding access to $10 a day childcare spaces, and helping find affordable rental housing. These are all things that are, that are happening. And um, I'm very proud that our government is going to introduce an anti-racism law, ref um, reforming the, out the outdated police act, and perhaps so many people in my community, so important, creating legislation to remove barriers to accessibility for those with disabilities. Those are many of the things that we have announced and will be doing in this session of Parliament. Now, thirdly, Mr. Speaker, uh, I'd like to turn to my th the third point I wanted to raise in this, in this debate, and that is simply to talk about my role as the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. I would be remiss if I didn't start by acknowledging the excellent work done by my predecessor, Mr. Scott Fraser, and all the relationships that he build, uh, built uh, across the province, and which I've inherited. Um, I returned to this work having been a treaty negotiator in the past and having served as a lawyer for Indigenous people, for companies and for governments across the country. And, and it's been wonderful to see the commitment that is being made to uh, a reconciliation in a way that frankly did not exist when I was doing that work previously in the province. Um, I need to say, Mr. Speaker, that the Declaration Act is first and foremost an enormous achievement of everyone in this place. I was not here. I take no credit for it. I have the honour of trying to implement it, to put meat on the bones of commitments that every single MLA in this place made. Solemn commitments to what is at bottom a human rights law. And I couldn't be prouder of the work that our government is doing in trying to advance meaningful reconciliation. We're revitalizing Indigenous languages. We're trying to improve child welfare legislation so more children can rightfully remain with their families and communities. And the hard work is only just begun. And of course, Mr. Speaker, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that the pandemic has exposed some pre-existing systemic gaps, yes, indeed racism, in some aspects of, of, of our community. A report, as you know, called In Plain Sight, shot this, shone the light on aspects of that problem in our healthcare sector, but housing and other basic services must also be addressed as well. And we hope we as well can in the future share our decision-making and prosperity with the Indigenous peoples in whose territory so much of our wealth has been derived and who have been stewards of, that of those territories since time immemorial. I want to acknowledge this, the strong, strong response from First Nation leadership to the COVID crisis. They've managed an ever-changing situation and kept their members safe. They've committed to do whatever they can to navigate this crisis and we're working together with the First Nation Health Authority and Indigenous leaders to ensure that their people remain safe. There's been some challenges. No one would deny that. But there has been as well, Mr. Speaker, an unprecedented level of coordination and cooperation between governments and First Nations as we go through this emergency together. And I think that in itself is a concrete example about how we're addressing reconciliation together head on. I think the, priorize, the prioritization of vaccinations for Indigenous peoples in this province speaks to our changing relationship. And with vaccines now administered to all First Nation communities and more than a million British Columbians overall, there's every reason to think things are going to improve soon for all of us. And we want to ensure the Premier has made it clear through mandate letters binding upon each and every minister that, that, that reconciliation is a critical part of our journey together. And there are important discussions about economic recovery after COVID that are currently underway as well with Indigenous leadership to ensure that participation is for all, not just for some, that prosperity is for all, not just for some. 
So there's been huge differences in the years since I was first negotiating treaties on behalf of British Columbia. I now have the honor uh, of, of serving in this role, and I, I do so with a sense of real optimism. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, uh, there is a need to do so much more. I don't really know in the time available to, uh, to catalog those, 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 uh, those challenges, trying to get our federal partners to work closely with us, and we do have a spirit of, of collaboration there that has been also, I think, quite inspirational. We've got to get down to the real work and, uh, and, and talk about things like revenue sharing and other aspects of prosperity that we will work on together. In conclusion, let me just say, as the Lieutenant Governor did in concluding that last year has changed us all in this province in ways we never could have imagined, we are at the end of this marathon, Mr. Speaker. We're tired, but we've got a solid foundation upon which to build. We are resilient. We will get through this together.